Hi, everybody. Andrew Champagne here in desperate need of a haircut along with J.D. Fox for this week's edition of Champagne and J.D. And what a week it is this week. Pegasus World Cup Day is coming up on Saturday at Gulfstream Park. We've got a great guest here to help bring us through the festivities. J.D., you know where I'm going with this. He needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway because that's just the kind of guy I am. If you're on horse racing Twitter, you know this guy. This is somebody that is a tremendous ambassador for the game. He's done work with Derby Wars. He does a tremendous podcast called Going in Circles with Chuck Simon. And something I will always be jealous of him for, he is a Beanie Award winner. Still think I got jobbed a couple of years ago. I want to throw that out there. Kidding aside, we are incredibly happy to have our friend Barry Spears with us this week. Barry, thanks for stopping by, man. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. It's going to be so much fun going through this late pick four on Pegasus World Cup Saturday. It is a 12 race program, a lot of stakes races, not just the Pegasus World Cup or the Pegasus World Cup turf, but a really strong lineup, a good day of betting races, more so than anything else. We'll get into the Pegasus fields as we go along. We'll dive into the turf and the dirt race. And we can talk a little bit about how, look, maybe these aren't necessarily the horses we wanted to see it leading up to this race. But what we have are some 12 horse fields. And I got to tell you guys, there are three pick four tickets that we're going to give you. If you want to show with three people that have wildly different opinions on a single pick four sequence, you've come to the right place. We're going to have so much fun. The Pegasus World Cup turf is the first race we're going to dive into. That goes as race number 11 on the 12 race program. And you see the field up there, courtesy of J.D. Fox and his technical wizardry. Todd Pletcher has a number of contenders in here. Suge McGahee has a number of contenders in here. Mike Maker has a couple contenders in here. Peter Miller ships another twist of fate in from California. It's a field of 12. There are a lot of different ways you can go. And for a betting race, I think this is the best race of the late pick four sequence. Barry, this is pretty cool because regardless of whatever horse you like, you're going to get a price more likely than not. Yeah. Uh, you know, like you said, this is an ultra competitive field. I mean, a lot of the contenders, they actually look the same on the, in, in their past performances. Um, so you, you kind of have to pick your poison and, and just make a decision and go with it. Uh, I mean, that that's kind of like the way I like to play races anyway. Um, and I, I, you know, whoever you decide on as, as a better in this race, you really can't knock it. Yeah, lots to like about a lot of different horses in this field. JD, a field of 12 horses, and there are a couple of horses in here that you're going to find very familiar, including a horse that I really liked, and that's number 11, Say the Word, who did a lot of great work on Woodbine last year, one of your favorite tracks, won the Northern Dancer two back, but is one of the couple of horses that I feel may have gotten hurt by the post position draw. He'll break post 11 in the 12-horse field. Yeah, really, uh, say the word, that Northern Dancer performance, I'll put that up against anybody that's running in this field. That was a that was a great race. Came back in the Hollywood Turf Cup, uh, you know, shipped to Del Mar, obviously shipped away from Gail Cox. It, this horse will come right back to Gail Cox uh, for the Woodbine season starting in uh, hopefully May, knock on wood there. Um, but you know, th this horse did nothing wrong. The sing spill performance was, was strong. And really that Northern dancer again on October 18th. Um, if you guys haven't seen the replay of that, I suggest you, you, you go out of your way to find it. Imaging Wilson with a great ride. Cardi and down the outside, Nakamura, say the word, and Sir Sahib. Count again's gone up to hit the front with Admiralty Pier and flying home, say the word, and back behind them, Sir Sahib, right down the outside. Say the word's gone to the front, Sir Sahib on the extreme outside, but it's say the word, and say the word wins the Northern Dancer by a length to Sir Sahib. Admiralty. The post position is a question, as as Andrew said, because this, this horse is going to have to get through some traffic here, especially going the mile and three sixteenths. Um, this horse usually, you know, best at a mile and a half, um, getting closer to that mile and a, and a quarter distance, but did win a, a race at a mile and three sixteenths um, at Saratoga. But then again, that was an inside draw. And you look at the successful um, season at Woodbine and that race at Saratoga and Del Mar, um, you know, post position one, post position two, post position one, post position one, post position four, different for this horse going to have to to 
probably trail the field, be a little further back. So while I really like this horse, the draw, I'm going extremely deep when it comes to ticket time. Really, I, I'm, I want to throw this to, to Barry here, the, the um, shape of this race from a speed perspective. Obviously, Storm the Court is going to be the first horse that I think of there, but this hasn't been the same Storm the Court um, this, uh, this campaign that we were kind of anticipating and, and hoping kind of that, that speedy horse that can, that can come around and, um, hold on to the speed. And, and obviously there's been disappointing performances in the Arkansas Derby, the Ohio Derby, you can go on down the line, but that Matt, this brother performance last time, do you, do you have some hope here for storm the court taking this field wire to wire? You kind of have to, um, because if you look at the past performances, that horse hasn't shown any speed really um, since uh, that Breeders' Cup win until the last out in, in the Mathis Brothers Mile. Um, so you, you got to have hope there. The only question mark is the distance. Um, I'm not really sure if, if Storm the Court wants to go that far. I mean, it's not like the horse isn't capable, but, you know, I, I – I, I just think that horse actually might take money just because of the speed and it might be just a little bit too, too short for me to take. Entirely possible. I liked him in the Mathis brothers mile. I thought he ran great that day. I think he's got a future at that level. I'm just not sure he's a grade one caliber turf horse. And this is a pretty good field. One that includes three runners from the Todd Pletcher barn, all of which could well be single digit odds. Colonel Liam is the very tepid morning line favorite coming off of a big one in the Tropical Park Derby last time out where he looked very, very good. Largent exits a win in the Fort Lauderdale going a mile and an eighth. The Pletcher horse that I may well like most is the one horse that drew worse than say the word though. <laughs> That's social paranoia who has done his best running over this turf course at Gulfstream Park. You go back to last year, he won the Appleton coming from way, way, way out of it. He was third in a stakes race where he probably didn't have the best ride and might have bounced a little bit, but came off of a long layoff last time out in an optional claiming event. That was a tough optional claiming event. The runner up that day, Olympic runner, is a runner. That's a stakes caliber horse. And social paranoia came from way back, wound up getting the money. The question is, how much trust can you have in that horse from the 12 hole? But if you like that horse, you're getting a horse who has done his best running over this turf course and that horse might well be, what, the fourth or fifth betting choice in the race? That's pretty attractive, right? Sombaye, Dr. Edgar back running again from last in Social Paranoia. Here comes Social Paranoia with a full head of steam. Here's Social Paranoia running by and going away to win the Appleton. Social Paranoia from last to first to win. Yeah, I think that horse is, is a little bit of a sleeper. Um, I, I think he's going to get cold on the board based, based upon just the, the post position alone. Um, I went back the other day and I watched his, uh, his win in the Appleton, and that was a pretty amazing race. He was completely gone. You, you couldn't even see him for most of the race, and he ended up winning. Um, I know that field wasn't all that great, Um in hindsight, it actually is a little bit better than what it looked on paper that day. Um, so him going this far, it, you know, that that's perfect. Um, I, I think he's well suited to the distance. It's just a, about the trip. If if Louis Sias can can work out a trip um, other than the dead last to first angle, I think he might have a pretty good shot and might be there when it when it when the you know when the wire comes. The, the one horse that I can't figure out in this field, five to one on the morning lines, another twist of fate. I don't think when this campaign started for Blaine Wright at the Long Acres Mile that this race was circled on the calendar. And obviously now in the Peter Miller barn, uh, tried dirt for the or tried turf for the first time, excuse me, in the Sea Biscuit. Um, strong performance there. And then in the San Gabriel, that was a strong win, but you know, not exactly facing Bob and Jackie in this in this field. What, what do you guys think of another twist of fate in this spot? I kind of like that horse in this spot. Um, I, I think he's going to get just a superb trip. I mean, he, he's got what I think is the best rider in the country right now in Joel. Um, I think he can just sit right off storm the court and take over and, 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 and just leave him in the dust. That's, you know, kind of almost similar. If he gets the same trip he got in the San Gabriel, 
he's going to be tough to beat. I don't like him. Uh, I've seen <laughs> the horses race outside of California. He was second in the Sunland Derby, second in the Lexington, horrible in the Preakness back in 2019, did win the Long Acres Mile, but there weren't any monsters in there. I liked the race last time out in the San Gabriel. On buyer speed figures, that's a good race, but he didn't really beat a whole heck of a lot that day. And I think this race came up surprisingly salty because of how forgettable, I'll be kind, the older turf division was last year. Channel Maker's probably going to win the Eclipse Award for that division. It was not a good division last year. Another twist of fate, though, if you like him, you're getting five to one. And if he wins the Pegasus, you're probably not going to get five to one again for a very, very, very long <laughs> time. So it's a fascinating race where I think you can go in a lot of different directions. And you'll see what directions we go in when we go through our late pick four sequences. We're going completely different directions. Barry and I actually had some words about our <laughs> there. And you'll see why when those tickets come up. However, we'll shift our attention now to the main event of the program, race number 12, the Pegasus World Cup Invitational, $3 million on the line, and we've got a field of 12 that is led by a Breeders' Cup winner. Not authentic. Authentic has been retired, but we get Nick's go. All he did last time out was put up a 108 buyer speed figure in winning the Dirt Mile in 133 and 4. He was flat flying. He's done nothing wrong since being switched to the barn of Brad Cox. He's five to two in here. And I feel as though if you look at this race, you're likely to have one of two opinions. Either you think Nick's go is a monster and that five to two is as much value as you're ever going to get on him. Or you think maybe a mile and an eighth's a little too far. He's never run a Gulfstream before. And you start poking holes and you think maybe he doesn't hit the board. J.D. Barry, how do you see this race? I would love to start somewhere else other than the obvious, but I really do feel as though the linchpin to this race is the horse that will almost certainly go favored and may well drift down off of that 5-2 to two morning line. I, I think I want to equate Nick's Go's last two performances to this. I think Keeneland was the Autobahn. You could go as fast as you wanted to on there and not get in trouble. You were going to be golden at the end of the race. Gulfstream Park is not that same surface. That was as souped up a surface as we will probably ever see in this country again because of the just the feedback and the hatred that everybody had for all of those track records and all of those speedy performances. I've had to figure out, based on horses coming out of that i've had to figure out my own way of uh degrading the speed figures uh a little bit based on that i also know that this horse used to be nick stop I, this horse had some of the worst performances that you're ever going to see on the front end i i've i've watched the gotham um back in um uh, in 2019 a few times just because this is what this horse to me is. And that is a, a horse that does not want this distance and is going to stop very quickly. So I want no part of Nick's go. Now, again, this horse in the Brad Cox barn has been a different horse than with Ben Colebrook. This horse can get a loose lead, but I also don't think this horse is lone speed in this race as well. So I don't think it's going to be an easy lead for Nick's go. So I am all out on Nick's go. Uh, no, want no part. Yeah, I, I can certainly understand that. I, you know, uh, in, in the pick four, pick fives, pick sixes, whatever. Um, I, I felt you kind of have to use them defensively because there is that, um, percentage of of that performance that can go into a race like this and be duplicated because the field isn't too great um and and he's kind of other than than honor uh code of honor uh probably the class of the race um so there there's really not too too much speed but you know there are some things to poke holes in and there there's enough cons on this horse for me to think that there there's probably more of a possibility of him losing than winning. Um, but I am going to use him defensively. The thing that I like about Nick's go is his works at the fairgrounds have been excellent. This is a horse that 
Had this horse been working at Keeneland and throwing up those times, I would have been, okay, maybe he's just a horse for course. Maybe that's the only track he runs those kinds of races on. But he's been working very, very well at fairgrounds. He comes in off of a bullet drill going five furlongs down there in a minute and three. The work before that, five furlongs in a minute and two. The work before that, six furlongs in 113. I simply think he is in career best form, and I think anything close to the dirt mile will mean everyone else is running for second money. Now, going elsewhere, this is another kind of race where if you like somebody as an alternative, you're going to get a price. And a horse that I think is going to take money, but one I want absolutely no part of at all whatsoever. I've been accused of having a very cold heart. I've been accused <laughs> by many people of being somebody that roots against the story. Sleepy Eyes Todd is one of the best stories in horse racing. You look at where that horse was running in April. That horse was running at Fawner Park. He goes, this is the journey. Fawner Park to Lone Star, to Charlestown, to Santa Anita, to Keeneland, to Gulfstream. And the horse is in career best form. He's won three of his last four starts. I want no part of him here. At all whatsoever. The race at a mile and an eighth three back at Santa Anita was by far his worst. I don't think he wants this traditional mile and an eighth distance. I think he's a very good seven furlong horse. I think he's a very good miler. And I think he lucked out a little bit in the Charlestown Classic when he got left alone on the lead on the bullring track. He's eight to one with his story. I think he gets bet down. And I think he'll be a very large underlay. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. Um, you know, I, I call this horse the king of COVID um, <laughs> because he, he just he blossomed in, in 2020. Yeah. Um, you know, but I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I, I think he is a more of a, a sprinter type, you know, mile and under is probably his best distance. Um, so, you know, he, I'm with you. I, I, I don't I don't like him at all. I don't I don't want any part of him. If he beats me, I will clap for him and I will readily mm -hmm. acknowledge this is a tremendous story, something people need to write about. JD, maybe you like him more than I do, more than Barry does. I just, I can't see it here. Well, what what I see is I see this as the potential pace partner for Nick's go. I don't think Jose Ortiz has any other choice from the rail but to send this horse. Possibly. And Sleepy Eyes Todd does have some early speed. The thing that I question is Nixco doesn't have to go 44 and 2 to make the lead in here. He doesn't. If he goes 23 46, I think he still makes the lead. And maybe that's just him on cruising speed. But if a horse goes with him, maybe a Sleepy Eyes Todd goes with him. Independence Hall has a little bit of early speed stretching out in distance. Tax is going to want to go early. But I'm not really a fan of tax because the race last time out, it certainly seemed as though he got a perfect trip, was coming off a long layoff, and I think a bounce may well be in play for that one. Last judgment is going to go early. You're going to get a horse like Mr. Freeze up there a little bit. But if Nick's go goes out in 46 and just decides, oh, I'm comfortable, I'm just going to coast on the front end here, and oh, I'll have plenty left plate, maybe it doesn't matter. However, with that pace setup I've just mentioned, if someone goes on a suicide mission, JD, that may well set things up for the horse that you like in this race. Yeah, I, I really there's there was two horses really that that I liked in this race, and I was trying to figure out what I thought was going to be the closer of the two between the eight Harpers first, the ten Code of Honor, and I think last. Uh, and and once I dug a little more with Code of Honor and looked at that this horse hasn't really got a pace to run into since probably the Travers um, back in 2019. It's been very soft paces that this horse has tried to make up ground and has actually successfully done it a few times. So I think if we get this genuine we're expecting, we're kind of playing into the best of Code of Honor, a horse we know that can get this distance and a horse we know that can close and pass good horses late in the race. And I do think Harper's first ride is probably going to be a little closer to the pace, so probably going to get first. So Harper's first ride, I definitely want to use underneath the my and the two hole, the three hole in my exactus tries and supers here. Um, but I do like code of honor as my top. And the one thing I want to say before we get into um, getting how Barry sees this 
races. I, I, where I struggle with Nick's go, and you bring up the work tab. I mean, this is a horse that has run 20 career bullets. This has been a superstar always in the morning. And I look at, you know, Brad Cox and this horse, and, you know, we've got eight works that are all quick since this horse last ran in the Breeders' Cup mile. I, I, I There's so much here that it doesn't add up to the horse racing brain and how I've been taught as a player. There's a lot of things here that strike me as red flags. And the fact that this horse is probably going to be seven to five, six to five, I just, I, I just can't do it. This horse very well might win, but I just can't do it. If, if Nick's go doesn't win Barry, who, who do you think has the best chance to, uh, to defeat uh, the Cox trainee? I think, um, I'm I'm kind of leaning the same way you are that if if uh, Nick's go stubs his toe and doesn't show up, um, Code of Honor is probably the most likely beneficiary of of any kind of pace factor. Um, and you know he he's definitely the class of the field. I I couldn't leave him off any kind of ticket. I'm not sure that he always wants to win. That that's really my only knock on him. Um, you know, and you might think this is a little crazy, but I think Independence Hall is, is probably sitting on a, a, a pretty decent race. And, and I expect him to improve way more than he did in, in the Malibu. I don't think that was his, his game at all. Um, I, I think this is more his speed. He's probably going to get the trip he wants, um, especially from the three hole. Uh so I'm I'm looking for for that kind of big price to at least hang around, but I I think Code of Honor ha, has the every right to win this race and, and and probably should. One note before we move on to the All Stakes Pick Four and we start dissecting tickets. If we're looking at horses underneath, what's wrong with Jesus's team? This is a horse that seems to run the exact same race every single time. J.D., you mentioned the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, which you called the Audubon going as fast as possible. <laughs> One horse made up ground late, and it was Jesus' team who rallied from seventh out of the 11 hole going a mile at Keeneland, which is not easy to do. Very short run up into the first turn going that distance. And that horse ran a pretty good second, came right back, won the claiming crown jewel here at Gulfstream Park, going the nine furlongs in 149-1. and one. Can he win? I don't necessarily think so. Can he run second or third, especially if the race falls apart late? I think absolutely. And I also think he'll drift up a little bit from that eight to one morning line. Lots of different directions that you can go in here. That's for darn sure. And there are a lot of different directions you can go in as it pertains to the all stakes late pick four, which begins in race number nine. I mentioned it beforehand and the parking garage behind me is going absolutely crazy because they know I'm not blowing smoke. If you want three completely different ways to play this sequence, by golly, you're going to get it. It starts with the inside information for older fillies and mares going seven furlongs on the main track. This a grade two event that drew a field of eight runners. The morning line, well, it tells you the story. This is a very competitive event. Cinnabunny, the morning line favorite, three to one for Brad Cox off of a third place finish in the grade three sugar swirl last time out in her first start for that barn. JD, you're driving the train here. Where are we going? I, I, I want to start here, and the reason why is I'm going to put my ticket up, and there's going to be a horse that I'm immediately – actually, there's going to be two horses that I'm immediately going to have to defend. So I just figure I need to get that out of the way as, as the start to the ticket here. So I'm starting 256, and the first horse I'm actually going to defend is the 6 Pacific Gale because you – say this all the time that i love horses that can't win races and this horse <laughs> last win was october 4 2018 i realized that i just think that based on the level of competition on the new york circuit i i think pacific gale might be quicker than cinnabunny and might be setting the fractions in the seven furlong, which again is such a specialist distance. I'm looking for horses that can run at that distance or potentially could run at that distance. So I think the two speeds, the two and the six to me, they're, they're the top two choices as, as Andrew does his hanger dance with Pacific Gale, because yes, there are a lot of second place uh, and third place finishes there. But my top selection in that race is the five uh, P80 Bianchi. 
And of course, Andrew, say your spiel that where, where is this race taking place? JB, I just want to make sure you know this. Okay. I know Katie <laughs> Bianchi has a very special place in your heart. She is an honest mayor. She's won six times. She's banked $600,000, but I want to make sure you know this. This is not a race for Indiana breads. It is not at Indiana Grand. This is a grade two event at Gulfstream. Okay. The one time this horse has ran at seven furlongs, it was at this on the West Coast called Del Mar. And it was the second in the grade one Del Mar debutante. This horse has not tried that distance since. And obviously the six-year-old mare has ran a lot since. I do think that we're seeing a different horse. They were trying some different things with different barns and the, the style of race on the turf, trying to send this horse in mile and 16th ventures on the turf. Wasn't what this horse wants to do. I just think this horse is sneaky, good, and probably the best closer in my eyes to this race. So I don't think anybody's going to get past the two and the six, but if anybody is in this field, it's going to be the five and I'm not going to leave a horse that's 12 to one morning line that based on this action that we're expecting one in an eight horse field is the um, highest morning line. And I'm honestly expecting 20 to one or more on this horse. I have a strong enough opinion that I think this horse can pass horses late that I have to include it on my ticket. So two, five and six, I'm going three deep. And uh, Andrew, I, I know you're you're a little shorter than me here in, in this race, so we'll let you go next. I'm 6'5". I'm not used to being short, but I am short in this particular <laughs> race. I'm going too deep. I'm using Cinnabunny. I thought the race last time out proved a lot, even though she ran third, being beaten three quarters of a length. She got left at the start, broke dead last in a field of six. Yes, the pace was solid, but they were going six furlongs, so it's not like the race really set up for a closer. I think she'll take a big step forward second time out for Brad Cox, but my top pick in the race is actually number four, This Is My Time, who has gotten very, very, very good for a capable horsewoman in Kathleen O'Connell. The last two starts have been excellent. She ran away with a stakes race for Florida Breds two back. Yes, that was in the slot at Gulfstream Park West, but she backed that up next time out here at Gulfstream going a mile. She went wire to wire that day, and it's not like she ran slow. She caught the first half mile in 45 and three and had plenty left, earned a 91 by her speed figure that day. I think this may very well just be a case of a filly that's really figured things out late in her three-year-old year, early in her four-year-old year, which of course is when a horse wants to peak most of the time. So this is my time as my top selection. She's seven to two on the morning line, and that would actually provide fair wind value, I think. Two, four for me in race number nine. Barry, how do you see it? Um, I thought this race was a lot more wide open than it appears. Um, but the the horses that are are not going to take any money, I don't like. Usually, I, could, I I really tried to really make a case for Petty Bianchi, and I and I just couldn't do it. Um, but that leads me to my top choice. I, I use the one, two, four, and eight. Um, my top choice would be uh, Dream Marie. I thought that the you know the last race um, against Latruska, who who just dominated that field. She ran pretty damn good behind her. Um, and I think that horse got a lot out of this race. I like the cutback to seven. Um, she's won at this distance already. I think it, it's go time. Um, she gets a good trip here. I, I think there's there's some speed. Um, and, and I think she, she's going to get the trip. She's going to be the trip horse. And, and hopefully she gets the perfect trip like I think she's going to. So to recap... All three of us have at least a little common ground. If Cinnabunny wins, we all move on. That is not the case moving forward. We'll move forward now into race number 10. Race number 10 is the WL McKnight. It's a grade three event for turf horses going a mile and a half. Big field signed on for this one. Good betting race. Sadler's Joy, the three to one morning line favorite. I think he comes down significantly off of that three to one figure simply because he's been around a long, long, long time. Easy horse to root for, always seems to get checks. The grade three level, probably about right for him at this point in his career. He's not quite a grade one horse anymore, but he'll still wind up running well against this type of horse. The problem is he's a deep closer. And man, I can't see any pace in this race. JD, where are we going? 
I want to I want to hear Barry's opinion in, in this race to start here going four deep um, because I don't want to I don't want to give first opinion and I certainly know seeing your ticket Andrew you do not. <laughs> well, you know I I, I had the notion um, when putting those four horses in the one seven eight and eleven um, that there isn't much speed in here. Doswell, in my estimation, will probably be the favorite. I, I think um, Sadler's Joy might be second choice. I, I, I really hope I'm wrong because I am totally against Sadler's Joy under any circumstances in any race. If he ever wins, he will beat me every time. I'm not betting on him. Um, so with that being said, my top choice would be number seven, Tide of the Sea. I think that horse is going to get a nice stalking trip, um, hopefully alongside of uh, – Doswell and kind of kind of out sprint them home. Um, I kind of threw in Sir Anthony uh, because of his last race. He's cutting back into mile and a half, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, it, it's been his best race. Uh, probably his career best race was his last. So I had to throw him in here at a price. And then the 11 uh, channel cat is definitely got a lot of back class that, um, he may be able to dial it back one more time being on the far outside. I think he's going to rise up from that nine to two morning line. And um, he's not without a shot if, if things tend to fall apart late. Yeah. And, and I share some common ground with you, Barry, there is I'm going uh, two, three, seven, eight. Um, so the seven uh, tide of the sea is, is my, uh, is my top choice as well for many of the same uh, reasons you, you mentioned. I, I want to, I want to talk a little bit more about Sir Anthony because this is just a fascinating horse. This Illinois bred. Um, if, if not the last race at Gulfstream park, you look back winning the grade three corn Husker at, at mile stopping grounds at Prairie Meadows was probably the best race that this horse has ran. But this horse has ran at every distance in at seemingly every track in North America, not just the country because this, this horse has actually ran at Woodbine. Um, I mean, th this horse is just a cool horse. It's a cool story. It's a homebred. Uh, and Richard Otto, the owner and breeder, still maintains control. And this horse, by my count, has ran at uh, at 11 different tracks on all three surfaces that we run in North America. I'm sure, at, you know, if this horse wasn't a six-year-old Ridgeling, they might ship to, you know, South Korea so they could run, to run this horse on sand. Like, this horse just is is great on on every surface and it's also one of the more interesting things i've i've seen you go from a allowance condition at hawthorne going 6 furlongs to a 2 mile race at gulfstream park and you win it i mean no wonder the horse was 28 to 1 but you look back at the past i, I mean this horse is bred for distance it makes sense uh, the two um inside runners that have the 2 and the 3 um uh really bred for the distance. And that's where I, I will agree that I think Doswell is probably the most talented horse in this field. I just have a really hard time making, getting this horse all the way to a mile and a half. It obviously won that allowance event at Belmont and a mile at a mile and a quarter. Uh, but that was really seeming to push the end of the day and, and got such a light tempo going coast to coast in that race. Um, I, I just, I don't see that horse being able to handle the distance. So I, I have four double digit odd morning line horses realizing that to me, I think tide of the sea is probably going to end up being the second choice in this race, probably four to one, five to one as my top selection. But I do expect this to be an upset and I know who else expects this to be an upset or is more hoping that it's an upset. And that's one Andrew champagne. Boom. I'm pressing it. I'm pressing the all button of glory repeatedly here. I don't have a clue. Um, this is one of those races where if you look at it, after a little while, it starts looking like Egyptian hieroglyphics because they all sort of look the same. In my instance, it's a collection of horses that I've needed at various points, and they've all run the exact same kind of one-paced race where they run third or fourth. It's those kinds of horses. I have bet succeed and surpass, I think, every time I have seen him run. And you know what? I could talk myself into him in this spot because it's his first time going a mile and a half. He's by exceed and excel out of a street crime air that's distance top and bottom. But you know what? 
just this is a collection of horses I want no part of. And the early pace situation is going to be fascinating. What's the over under for the first half mile? Are we talking like a 51, 52 half mile? And if that's the case, what rider is going to find himself on the lead with a horse that really has a lot left in the tank late? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. And I've gone slim enough elsewhere to where I can afford to hit the all button in this race. Now, I am not sold on Sadler's Joy at his current price. I don't know if Doswell wants to go this long. There are so many what ifs in here. I just couldn't even begin to narrow things down. So I'm hitting the all button. I'm moving on. I'm going to sit back, relax, probably drink an ice cold Coke Zero product placement for the win. And just hope we get a price home. If it succeeds and surpassed, that'd probably be great. I'll probably talk myself into using them in contests and stable dual stuff and a whole bunch of different things. But I'm hitting the all button because I don't trust him as far as I can throw him. So the, the, just, the last thing, the last word I want on this race from both of you guys. Okay, Sadler's Joy three to one. I have heard nobody who thinks that Sadler's Joy should be the favorite in this in this race. Uh, what do you guys think the off odds on Sadler's Joy are going to be? I'm going to say eight to one. Uh, I'd say nine to two. Seven to two. Okay. Um. All right. I, I just think I think Doswell is going to be the favorite, and I don't think it's particularly going to be close on the on the win board end. But um, all right. Now we we touched on the uh, the last two races here, but now we're going to give our our picks and selections. Obviously, the Pegasus World Cup Turf Invitational Stakes. It's a mouthful. It'll be race eleven, four year olds, and up going a mile and three sixteenths on the uh, turf course at Gulfstream Park and. Nothing has changed from earlier in the show. There are still 12 horses signed on to this one. And Andrew, since you were so wide last time with an all button, I, I'm assuming you narrow here and you probably have an opinion. So I'm going to let you lead off. I've narrowed a little bit. I'm going four deep in an 11 horse field. So I'm spreading a little bit, but I think Todd Pletcher has a very powerful hand in here. Colonel Liam is a horse that he was very high on at Saratoga last year after he ran a hole in the wind in an allowance race, came back in the Saratoga Derby, didn't have the best trip when fourth beaten less than a length, goes to the sidelines, comes back, gets that horse running second off the bench. That one would make a lot of sense. I need to use Largen as well off that surprising one in the Fort Lauderdale last time out. Maybe he's got that one going well. And I need to use social paranoia, as I hinted earlier. This is a horse that loves Gulfstream Park. The distance, a little bit of a concern. The outside post, though, not so much. It's a mile and three sixteenths. One would think that Luis Saez would have enough time to drop back and at least save a little bit of ground going into that first turn. And the same can be said for Flavian Pratt aboard Say the Word, horse number 11. Say the Word for me at six to one would hit me as a value play. This is a horse that, provided he gets some early speed up front, will come running late. Phil D'Amato is enjoying a really strong run of success over on the West Coast, so wouldn't surprise me at all if, say the word, Rally got the money and got grade one win number two. Five, six, 11, and 12 for me. I am not using another twist of fate simply because I wasn't quite as impressed with the San Gabriel as you guys were. If that one beats me, he beats me, but I think there's a real chance another twist of fate goes off favored in this race. So I'm taking a little bit of a stand and throwing out a horse that I think is going to take some money. Four deep, five, six, 11, and 12. All right. I'm going to go next because this is where I just go off and on a tangent. I'm getting crazy favorite. with the cheese whiz time. Um, if you if you looked at the morning line and you looked at, let's see, the first morning line choice, the second morning line choice, the third morning line choice, you'll realize that none of them are on my ticket. And I actually only share one horse with Andrew here. Um, I, I talked about Say the Word. I, I think Say the Word is, is a, a win play for me. I think Say the Word might have even been bet down to favorite in this race with a better draw. But I, I still have to back myself up. And there's some horses that intrigue me. Um, looking back at Aquaphobia and the Red Smith and what our Irad Ortiz did is took this horse way, way back. This was one of the great performances. If there was a webcam in my house that was recording this at the time in the room I was in, it was no Irad, what are you doing? No Irad, what are you doing? Oh my god, we might in this win this race. No Irad, what are you doing? 
that was the the course of this big sweeping move where this horse basically looked like a quarter horse sweeping around the turn and then just absolutely stopped it was it's if you haven't watched the replay it is one of the darndest things you will see in a long time i i think there's a lot of talent there in aquaphobia and with the same trip where this horse likes to go this horse loves this distance so i i'm gonna give a pass on the red smith i'm gonna give a pass in the sycamore because that was another trip where this horse was basically on the lead this horse needs to sit mid pack obviously this horse won the united nations this summer i don't think this horse should be 20 to 1 in this field but given the field maybe the last few races that makes sense um the other horse i really want to talk about is the 10 pixelate now that last race at fairgrounds was very, very strong. You're looking at, oh, well, that was only a mile. And there are some questions if this horse can get the distance. But this horse has looked impressive and has a nice kick, which is something I'm going to need in a distance turf race at Gulfstream. So I'm looking at this horse as somebody that has not ever ran at Gulfstream. And there are definitely some horse-for-course -course angles that love that turf course. Based on how this horse has performed other tracks, I'm thinking this horse might be one of those. So I'm including pixelate along with the you know the other horses crazy i mean basically what this comes down to before we even get to the final leg and my ticket is i think this is going to pay a lot of money and if my ticket specifically comes in this this is going to pay like you're going to have to pay uncle sam quite a bit type money so um i'm three four seven nine ten and eleven top choice eleven here in the pegasus turf cup barry bring some sanity to the show please i'm trying I'm trying. You guys, you guys are making it easy for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really was very, very close to just singling another twist of fate here. Um, that's that's how much I do like this horse. Uh, again, his last race was was a, a pretty stellar performance. I know it wasn't the the greatest field, but I just think it was something to build on, and and kind of that's that's kind of uh, Peter Miller's mo. Um, I did, however, want to throw in cross-border. Uh, if you saw his race in the Delberto Memorial uh, at, at the fairgrounds, he was wide the whole way and, and just got beat ahead. And basically, that, that's what cost him the race. He probably should have won. Um, he gets Tyler G today, who behind Irad and Paco Lopez probably rides that turf course at, at Gulfstream better than anybody. Um, so I'm expecting a lot more improvement off that, that one off the layoff. And I, I think he, he's going to give himself every chance to win this too. So I, I really couldn't separate them that much, but I, my, my top choice would be another twist of fate. I just, I'm just hoping he's not like what you guys are saying that he'll, he'll be the chalk because I just don't like chalk. Yeah, I hear you. Cross Border actually made me some money over the summer. He got very, very good up at Saratoga. And he was second in this race last year, beating just a neck. So it's not like it'd be inconceivable for him to be the horse that winds up on the front end in this kind of a race. So once again, though, Barry, you and I share six horses, none in common. JD, we've covered most of the field and we have one horse in common. When I told you we have wildly differing opinions, that was not false advertising. It was very, very real. And nowhere is that more evident than in the main event of the program. This is the Pegasus World Cup Invitational. $3 million on the line. Older horses going a mile and an eighth on the main track. Nick's go is the 5-2 to two morning line favorite, and you probably think he either wins or finishes off the board. I don't think there are a lot of people out there who are picking him second or third. Based off his running style, he's got one way of going, and we'll see how long he takes him. Now, J.D., where do you want to go here? Because the three of us all have just three completely different ways of looking at this race. Yeah, I, I think I, I want to go to Barry here just because he's including multiple horses. And uh, I don't think we have had a chance to talk about all the horses that he's looking at here. I don't think we've talked about North or um, three, four, five, ten. I don't think we've talked about a couple of these horses. So, Barry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'll start with Independence Hall. That that horse is, is 
more or less my sleeper. I, I think that horse is going to run a good race. Whether it's good enough to win, I'm not sure. I know that horse can win based upon the, the makeup of the entire field and the way this, this race might actually shake out. Um, he'll be in a good spot. I mean, if you watch a lot of racing at Gulfstream, you know you need to be kind of near – near the pace. I mean, it, it's not really conducive to any kind of closing activity on the dirt. Um, usually the move is maybe a length or two. Once they hit the top of the stretch, you can make up that ground. If not, you're going to have a tough time. And I think if, if independence hall, I, I saw him today um, kind of at school in the paddock. He's, he's got, got a little feisty, a little fresh. So hopefully he can, he can chill out <laughs> by Saturday. Um, Nick's go is not a horse. I'm, I'm overly, enthusiastic about um he can win certainly and and he could blow the doors off this field um but like you said there's also the opposite and i'm counting on I, I, i'm kind of counting on the opposite i probably shouldn't have thrown him in because i really don't want him to win but i i think i'd feel stupid if he wins by five and i left him off the ticket because he seems so logical um, Jesus's team has, has run some bang up races. If you go through all of his past performances, um, particularly this year, he, he's been running solid races. He just hasn't put it all together. And, you know, there's no, no better time than the present for him to, to kind of do that. The one knock I have on him, which, um, my friend Chuck Simon kind of noted and pointed out to me is that he ran a little bit too hard, I think, than they wanted to in the claiming crown jewel, uh, claiming crown jewel um, back on December 5th. Um, I, I think that might have took a little out of him. Um, hopefully it doesn't, but we'll see. And, and I'm going to give him a shot because he's been running hard and he's been close. And all those horses like Authentic, Swiss, uh, Swiss Skydiver, there's nothing like that in here. So he has every right to improve and, and possibly be there right at the finish. And then um, Code of Honor, I think that that's the horse to, to, to reckon with only because, you know, he could be the beneficiary of any kind of pace scenario that, that develops. If it doesn't develop, he's going to have a tough time, but he's still classier, I think, than all the rest of the horses in this field. Nine to two is, is, is a pretty decent value. If he's under that, it's a little bit shaky, but you know, I I'll take my chances. All right. Uh, Andrew, I, I think you, you've made it clear where you're going and I want to take this time to remind people that they see the Maryland bread Knicks go. The K is for Korea. The knit, the uh, Knicks is for talking about crosses when you're in a talking about pedigree. So Tell us what you like about the horse not named for the New York Knickerbockers or Madison Square Garden, Knicks go. Well, first of all, I like that he's not named after the Knicks because he was if he was if he was named <laughs> loser. after loser. Oh boy, oh boy. Knicks go if he runs anywhere close to the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, the race is going to be over down the backstretch. Um, I respect a lot of horses in this race. I think there's value to be had in playing the vertical exotics with Nick's go on top and a couple of bigger prices underneath. I think Jesus's team, for instance, is one that could absolutely hit the board at a pretty big price. And there are a couple of others in here that wouldn't surprise me if they did that at a nice number. But you mentioned it, Barry. Um, you want to be on or near the lead at Gulfstream Park. And there is absolutely no doubt what the game plan is for Nick's go. This is not going to be an educational experience where they take Nick's go back off of horses and see how he reacts with dirt in his face. <laughs> What's not going to happen here? Nick's go is going to go, and he's going to go very fast. I think we're going to have a really good picture of how this race is going to develop at the quarter pole, first quarter. If they go 23 and change, everyone else is going to be in trouble. If they go 22 and 1, 22 and 2, then the rest of the field's got a shot. Barry, you mentioned it earlier. Joel Rosario is riding as well as anyone in the country right now, maybe better. I think Nick's go is going to be put in a prime position to do what he wants to do. And I just can't get overly excited about anybody else potentially catching him. Nick's go is a single for me. I'm hoping we catch a price in my all race, the second leg of the pro of the pick four. And hopefully we can make this pick for pay a little bit with the field sizes, what they are. My guess is, and the way that I'm structuring this ticket is 
almost as an enhanced odds win bet on Nixco because Nixco is five to two on the morning line. I don't think he's going to go all the way down to six to five, but eight to five, nine to five, no problem. That seems about where he's going to wind up. And if we can turn an eight to five or a nine to five shot into a four to one, five to one shot with a horse that isn't particularly crazy in the second leg, it's not sexy, but the math checks out. That's what I'm trying to do here, and hopefully we're alive to where Nick's go can go out in front early and improve his positioning by the time they hit the wire coming around the second time. Nick's go is a single for me. I know JD has a single, and I knew as I was putting this ticket together, I knew that if he had a single, it would not be my single. I know my co-host, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> but you thought it was going to be Math Wizard because I always single Math Wizard. Yeah, I, I was very happy to be wrong there. I, I will say that that I, that I singled Code of Honor here, and and I gave my reasoning earlier in the show. I, I think really that's that's a, I think the pace and the setup of this race could be perfect. There's going to be no excuses on this trip. I don't think for Code of Honor, I I I, I don't see any developing. So unless there's a stumble or something, to me this is the pace setup that code of honor has been looking for even for the past 18 months and is going to get in this race. If I were including one more horse in this race, I know I had mentioned Harper's first ride before I'm going to throw a horse out there that we haven't talked about at all. And it's an interesting angle. It's not necessarily an angle I use, but it's a horse that kind of makes sense. If you start peeling back the, the onion layers here, kiss to gay goodbye. I knew you were going there. Mike Smith. The Hall of Famer is flying out to Florida, taking a whole weekend worth of work off at Santa Anita to run in this race with this horse for Eric Krulljack. That is interesting by itself. Then you look at the San Antonio. This horse was 15 to 1. This horse just, you know, broke the maiden earlier in the year in what was a not, not really spectacular race at Santa Anita. But the improvement that this horse has seen recently since going back on the dirt after a couple graded stakes efforts is very, very interesting to me. I think we haven't seen the best of Kiss Today Goodbye. I think Kiss Today Goodbye could be a very, very strong horse in this division in his four-year-old year. Maybe it's a little too soon in this spot, but I think Kiss Today Goodbye is going to get a piece of this race, guys. And I think there's some telltale signs. I don't think Mike Smith is jumping on this plane for Eric Kruljak unless he thinks this horse can win the race. That's a really good point. And that was one of the horses that I thought, look, do I think Kiss Today Goodbye could win? I don't think so. I was not impressed with the field in the San Antonio. Mucho Gusto was a very heavy favorite, wound up not firing, wound up being retired. Idol was trying stakes company for the first time. Take the one on ones, a nice little horse, but graded company had seemed to be out of his element up to that point. But Kiss Today Goodbye, to his credit, ran a really nice race, rallied from last to first. Again, don't necessarily think the horse could win, but might be another one you want to throw in underneath in your exactas and trifectas at a little bit of a price. And this field has a lot of those kinds of horses that may well clunk up with the right trip. Harper's first ride, you mentioned. There are a couple of others in here that I think might be decent prices. Mr. Freeze won a great two just three starts ago, was up near the lead in the Clark. Maybe that wasn't what he wants to do. You can make a lot of excuses for a lot of these horses, and you're going to be getting prices simply because – Nick's go is going to be a very heavy favorite and it's a 12 horse field. So there's a lot of different directions for the money to go. Yep. So I'm making this $36 play three by four by six with a single to close it out. Uh, Barry, you're going $64, four by four by two by four. And we'll roll through Andrew with his all button of glory, which again will change if, uh, if there's a scratch, that's I'm one of the great, like the diet Coke button that got moved out of the oval office, all button, all button, all button. Where's the Butler. Although I will say you generally have to try to get a $44 ticket. So kudos to you for figuring out how to make that work. <laughs> Thank you. Math -wise. Thank you. I, it's one of my favorite value. Uh, one of my other favorites is I did a 3251 once, 65 wagers, $32 and 50 cents. 
Yeah. So um, those are how we're playing it. And obviously we'll be updating if there's scratches or anything um, on Saturday, we'll, we'll be on Twitter uh, updating those tickets and, and having a fun time. And, and two of the three of us will be gambling on it and Barry, you're going to be gambling on it in person. So, Hey, yeah. it should be a good time. Yeah. I, I, the only way I could gamble on it would be in person. And unfortunately uh, that's, that's uh, not in the cards this year. So we're, uh, Although amongst us, I mean, at least I've been to Gulfstream Park multiple times when Andrew Champagne. Yeah, I haven't. My dad went to the old one. I have not gone to the new one or any of the other preceding ones down in Florida. So got to get there. We'll see what happens. Maybe when the world stops breaking on itself, like for goodness sake. <laughs> uh, time for our final thoughts segment. And I'm going to jump in because JD wasn't here last week for me to tell him this. And he's wearing the appropriate shirt. JD, congratulations on Francisco Lindor. I'm happy for you. They're the Mets. They'll find a way to blow it. We will. We'll, we'll find a way to blow it because you notice this says 1986 World 86. Series. Champ. <laughs> yeah. I was at least alive, but yeah, I mean. Uh, that was two years before I was born. More than two years, actually. <laughs> Guys can't do this, man. You're making me feel old. <laughs> oh, we love you, Barry. Now, we actually were talking about this before the show, but giving you a rundown, we have a final thought segment where we give our guests the opportunity to expound on anything in the world you'd like to talk about, anything you'd like to promote, anything you'd like to shine a light on. Then we'll obviously do our usual degenerate debauchery. But for the moment, the floor is yours, Barry. You know, honestly, I, I don't have much to say typically, which, you know, people might not think that just looking at my Twitter feed. However, I just want to get this COVID over with, please. I mean, I know I'm going to the, to the Pegasus on Saturday um, with limited attendance, but, you know, I, I'm missing it. I, even my daughter, she, she calls Gulfstream Park Derby Horse. So she's like, when can we go back to Derby Horse? And, and you know, we just want things to go back to normal. And, and, and I want everybody to have a nice, safe and healthy year. Um, I know I had a bout with sickness. I, I know uh, JD did. Uh, so let, let's just be positive and get things going in the right direction. Fingers, toes and eyes crossed, brother. That's for darn sure. JD, you've got two weeks worth of final thoughts in you. I really hope I'm not disappointing by setting up for that. Oh yeah, you you completely are because I mean Barry took a lot of my thunder here. Is is what I'm focused on in 2021 is is being healthy and and I'm I'm lucky in that I've I've got uh, shot one of the vaccine done and uh, dose number two is is coming uh, shortly for me. And given my my health, which some of you guys know, I'm not going to really expand upon it in the, uh, in this podcast. But as Barry mentioned, um, uh, you know, we we both had a have had a tough health time, and and we're both doing a lot better. And that's why I'm I'm glad to to have Barry on here, and and we uh, we fought through some stuff, and and I hope everybody um, gets healthy, and we can get over this COVID, and obviously we can get back to the uh, the racetrack, and you know, in certain cases, um, you know get the track open um you know obviously what's going on in ontario is very close to to my heart in you know the nhl returning but um mohawk not being able to open for woodbine entertainment group and probably that putting a delay eventually on horses hitting the training track at woodbine proper and getting their season uh, underway so obviously jim lawson did a great job they had one they had one positive COVID test at either Mohawk or Woodbine for their entire meeting in 2020. And yet yeah. they're shut down. It, it, it's crazy. They did such a great job. And I know, you know, because of, of things, we've got friends in the industry like Jennifer Morrison, who's not finding work right now because of the early shutdown of Woodbine and, you know, Mohawk not being open and things like that. I mean, there's been some good uh, stuff on social media about what Woodbine brings to Ontario and how many people it employs and everything. So I'm just, you know, imploring the Canadian government because we've got a new government that I'm kind of happy with. So I'm not really going to make any impl uh, implorations towards uh, the U S but I can, I can towards uh, Ontario and, and our friends up North in Canada. So that's what I've got for you, Andrew. And um, I, I also will say that last week's guest, uh, Natalie Voss, I don't know if you guys saw this today, but um 
she was on La Trifecta on, uh, a on ABR. So if you want to hear um, Natalie Voss try to converse in Spanish, it is much must watch uh, on, <laughs> on social media. Yeah, I'm going to need to take a look at that. I, I'd love to hear what uh, what her agent had to go through in order to get her that gig. I'm sure there's a there's a funny story going on there. Shout out to the Neville's clan. That was a really fun interview that we had last week talking about thoroughbred aftercare. That's up on our YouTube channel if you want to take a look. You mentioned the COVID vaccine. My dad just got his first shot today, so that's fantastic. Really happy about that. Some good news about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that may well be coming out in the next couple of weeks. That's a one-shot-and-done kind of deal, so fingers, toes, and eyes crossed that those who need the vaccine are going to be able to get it. On a little bit of a lighter note, I, I try not to go into politics here, but this one is pretty bipartisan. It must really stink to be Bernie Sanders today, and here's why. <laughs> Bernie Sanders, whether you agree with him or you disagree with him, whatever, has spent the last four plus decades of his life, maybe more, I don't know, as a dedicated public servant at a lot of different levels. Dude's campaigned for president a couple of different times. He's done a lot of good for a lot of people. And now he's a meme because he was an old man in Washington in January and was cold. I feel so bad for him being in that kind of situation. Having said that, shout out to a friend of the program, Craig Milkowski, who oh, had a man. of all of these photoshopped images of Bernie Sanders. My personal favorite one was the one of him next to Andy Serling at Belmont <laughs> Park in that third porch setup that they had. It, they're all good. That one is my personal favorite. Uh, by all means, go to Twitter. It's there. That's some of the best of what horse racing Twitter has to offer. We can go on for days about the worst horse racing Twitter has to offer. But when horse racing Twitter is at its best, it's a damn fun place. And that was pretty darn cool to see. So, Greg, nice work, buddy. <laughs> and we'll we'll have uh, the master of the time form U.S. figs on soon. And maybe sooner than we think, because maybe we're going to get some big figures at Gulfstream on Saturday. All right, Andrew, um, since I'm out of practice, uh, why don't you close up the show and him with the catchphrase? Well, for Barry Spears, our special guest, thank you very much, by the way, Barry. For J.D. Fox, my co-host and my technical wizard, I'm Andrew Champagne. Best of luck this week for the Pegasus World Cup. Also, best of luck this week at Oakland opening up their meet on Friday. But remember, the vaccine's still out there. Not everybody's gotten vaccinated yet. Let's all be safe and stay off the beaches. Take care, everybody.